Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, I usually start with asking if there's any questions about the assignment, but there is none yet. Uh, so regarding the assignment, then, uh, we are going to post one later today, uh, just have to finalize some of the details, but this is the last pure MPI lecture that we'll have anyway. So that, I guess, sort of makes sense. That's, there you go. Okay, so we are going to, to look at more MPI today. And so more parallel programming across nodes uh, because the nodes on one machine aren't enough to speed up your program or because your application is too large and needs more memory than fits on a single node. Um, in that case, you need several nodes with distributed memory and that memory can't be seen by the other nodes unless they pass messages that was mpi and so we're, we're, we ended last week with the domain decomposition and we're going to continue with that now as one of the the main ways people solve the problem of having too large a problem or too slow a problem um, so uh, imagine that we're looking at the diffusion equation and we looked at this a little bit before um, where we have a, a, a mathematical equation we discretize it uh, with finite differences and we, we do time marching. That means we do one time step and if we do a finite uh, delta T time step. And then after that, uh, at the next time step, et cetera, et cetera. But imagine that the problem is too large for the whole domain to fit in the memory of one node. Then we have to decompose it. We have to give some part of this problem to one node, another part to another, et cetera. Okay, so we are gonna use MPI for that. Um, so just to recap how this went, we saw this in the partial differential equation lecture as well. Um, when we're solving an equation like this, for instance, the, the diffusion equation, so the time derivative of the, the T, capital T, let's call it temperature field, uh, is, is equal to the second derivative of it with respect to the position uh, times some diffusion constant or thermal diffusion constant. What we have to do is we have to discretize this. This is a continuum. We, we will want to work on a grid. So here's our grid. And so our second derivative is approximated by taking the sum of the neighboring values on this grid and subtracting twice the value in the middle and then dividing by delta x squared to make it actually uh, an approximation to this derivative. It's an approximation. The finer the grid, the better the approximation. You could come up with other ways to approximate this more accurately by taking more points. But here we have just three points, the two neighbors in itself, and we can, we can write it as a what's called a stencil. Uh, and so the stencil says um, a plus one minus two plus one, which, which means uh, add one of the neighbor, minus two of itself and one of itself. So the stencil is, is a useful way of thinking about what is happening to each point because we're then gonna use that, uh, that approximation to, to construct the next time steps values. Yes. Um, so that's what we did for, for 1D. Um, and we, we even saw how you, how you would derive that, but this, this is the result. So for spatial separation, <clears throat> delta x, um, the real thing we want to solve has an infinite grid. So we're imagining our grid is fairly, fairly small, fairly fine. So we have a lot of points to, to store. There's a time step delta t, uh, and so these were the approximations. Um, in, in Monday, we will have a grid index, that's i, uh, then the time step index will, will be denoted by uh, uh, this superscript here, just to, to know this. This is time, this is this is space. So um, we can also approximate the time derivative, which we will have to do um, in a sort of order, uh, uh, Eulerian fashion, if you want. <clears throat> and so what that, uh, what that allows us to do is to express t at time n in terms of t at time n minus one. Uh, so that's, that's your time stepping. You can generalize this to 2D, 3D, et cetera. Your stencils just become a little bit more complicated. But again, it's, it, it, the, these uh, somewhat lengthy expressions can just be visualized in terms of this stencil. In 3D, again, it's something similar. Um, you always have a plus one in the, near, the, the, ne the nearest neighbors and then a, a, a negative uh, six for three and eight for four dimensions if you ever want to do that, et cetera. So generalize this quite nicely. So why am I going back to this, this, uh, this method of how to discreetly solve these equations? Well, um, there is an issue even in the regular case uh, where we're not paralyzing yet to deal with boundaries. 
these stem cells uh, for the boundary cells, the cells at the very uh, beginning and end, say, of the, of the domain, they jut out, right? So how are you going to do that? And so a common solution to that was to add guard cells. So you have your cells that are your actual domain that you will that you work with, and then you add some cells um, to uh, that are sort of pretend cells that are just adjusted such that the uh, boundary conditions are met. Uh, so for 1D, it kind of looks like this. So say our real domain is from 1 to 5. We have these padding cells or guard cells or, or ghost cells or something false, but they're, they're, they aren't real cells. Um, in this case, we only need one guard cell on each side. So NG is 1. Um, because the stencil only overlaps one to the left, right? So if I wanted to apply the stencil to uh, cell one here, I need cell zero. I need something there to make it work. And I can actually uh, choose zero such that the boundary condition is, is conserved. So for instance, what if I wanted um, uh, boundary conditions that are zero um, at, the, at the edges? I can just set these ghost cells to zero and that works. So, so that's that's a, a nice way to, doing, to implementing boundaries uh, um, without having all kinds of if conditions, you just set the go cells to whatever you do, but then you only have to apply the stencils to the real physical domain from one to five in this case, right? So from um, NG, which is one here to uh, N minus two NG. And it's the total number of cells I have. In 2D, this generalizes again. So now we have um, ghost cells all around. So we have a, a whole surface of them in 3D again, uh, um, you can imagine what, what would happen. So this is a nice way to solve the boundary condition problem, but um, what does this have to do with parallelizing with MPI? Uh, well, it turns out that using guard cells is very, very handy when parallelizing applications with domains that are too large. So what we're going to use is domain decomposition uh, as a general strategy uh, for, for solving this uh, memory limitation. So this is the same slide I showed last week, but these are some applications that actually use domain decomposition. Um, airflow around an airplane, if you want to simulate that, um, it's going to be too expensive for, for a single core and even single node. So you're going, to, uh, you're going to have some sort of mesh that solves the Napier-Stokes equation and, and other things. Uh, so that mesh is, has to be adapted such that um, the different nodes have a similar amount of work to do, otherwise, otherwise some nodes are just waiting for the, uh, the poor nodes that got too much work. And so it, it's kind of complicated, but it is domains. They're finite domains. They have uh, some edges where they, they meet. And in those edges, just as you, the, the stencils, whatever they are in this application, will overlap. And so you will need some of the information of the other, uh, of the other domain. So the domain is decomposed. Similarly, if you had like molecular dynamic simulations, they have some, some atoms or molecules, um, and there's say too many to, to store, or it's too slow to store them all on one, one node, um, you'd give typically um, one portion of the, of, the, um, of the system to one process and the next portion to another process, et cetera. And um, now in this case, these, these are atoms, they move around, so sometimes, an atom might move from one process to the other. It's a little bit, uh, it can be a little tricky, but it's, it's, it's what people do for, for MPI parallelizing molecular dynamics. Uh, climate simulations here is, is kind of similar to, uh, to the, the airflow example. <clears throat> again, you separate things and, and, and body systems again have a, a sort of irregular and often dynamic um, distribution of, of the domain decomposition. <clears throat> so in all cases, you'll have that you need to communicate with your neighbor domains. And if you have to communicate with your neighbor domains, that communication turns out to be fairly expensive. Uh, it, it, if it's a true different node, then it has to go across the network and uh, getting data across the network is just slower than data that's already on the node. So you can imagine that, but it's actually quite a bit slower. So you want to minimize the, uh, the boundaries between the domains, while at the same time making sure that the, the, the load is balanced. So <clears throat> this is why these all are sort of semi-convex uh, uh, domains so that the, the, the area to, to volume ratio is as small as possible. That is another way to say you, you maintain locality. You keep as much of the data as possible that you need um, in the same process. <clears throat> Okay, so that is that is the general case. Let's look at how this would apply to our diffusion equation. 
So now suppose we have a, a linear diffusion equation, so just 1D, um, and we want to split it in over two processes. These processes do not see each other's memory, right? It's distributed memory. So at every time step, they're going to need some data from the other folks. So here, I, I mentioned that um, the domain was 10 cells big. And so the fifth cell here, which is uh, owned by process zero, uh, will need the cell uh, that is this index six here uh, in, in process one. So process one has to send this cell six to, uh, to uh, uh, process zero somehow. Um, it's not necessarily so that process zero considers this six, it probably considers it, it's one, but that's a, a sort of a bookkeeping issue. But what is nice is that if you use the same idea of guard cells, where we say, okay, we have a domain, this is our real domain, and we have two guard cells to make up for the fact that um, uh, we need more cells to make the stencil work. Then for the left cell here, we do the same thing as we did before boundary conditions. So. Uh, in the example, it was setting this to zero. Um, but for the right cells, rather than setting it to zero, that's not applicable. Uh, what we do is we copy the value of the other process into here. Now, we can't just copy that. And that's, we have to send messages. So we have to do it by message passing, where both process zero and process one know that a message is going to get sent from six, from, from uh, sorry, from process one to process zero, and then process zero is, is in charge of making sure that that gets put in this ghost cell. Um, and process uh, one is in charge of making sure that this is the cell sent. And likewise, uh, process one here needs something from process zero. It needs the cell that is indexed five here uh, and, and copied it to its ghost cell. It probably calls that ghost cell zero itself because it's a completely different um, process. <clears throat> So I, I like this approach a lot because as far, apart from the, the interchange, the algorithm of solving the equation is like, like before, but with a funny boundary condition. So this looks like an isolated system that runs. It's just smaller than the real system, uh, but it gets its boundary condition through these MPI interchanges. So the, the, the algorithm doesn't have to change all that much uh, the code doesn't have to change that much from a serial code. The only difference is how the boundary is, is treated, how the ghost cells are treated. So this would be very different if we didn't use ghost cells. If, if we saw in the, uh, the linear algebra lecture that one way to solve boundary conditions is, is to change the matrix that you're using. Um, so there's a matrix to be solved, the matrix equation, you, you fiddle with the matrix so that the boundary cells, are, the boundaries are, are uh, satisfied. And you can do that, uh, but that is harder to generalize to an MPI process where there's also interchange. It's not impossible, but it makes it really tricky. Whereas here, um, we just apply our stencils to the innermost portion and deal with both cells, either as boundaries or coming from other processes. So what does that look like? Uh, for the diffusion process in particular. So uh, remember in the diffusion process that the, uh, the thing we have to compute is uh, ti minus one minus two ti plus two uh, ti plus one, uh, sorry, plus one ti plus one for the stencil. That stencil here in this serial version is right here. Here's ti plus one plus ti minus one minus two ti, okay? And the way it works out in the time stepping is that and that is the, a, an approximation to the second derivative. It needs some sort of prefactor, and then it's added to the original TI, and it gives you the new TI, the, 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 the TI at the next time step. Um, so um, we will imagine that we have N cells in the interior. So they are, um, they are labeled one to N. Um, there's an array that starts from zero and goes to N plus one, um, and those are the guard cells, okay? So guard left has an index of zero. I just stored there to make it clear that this is the left guard cell and guard right. Mm -hmm. Was there a question? Oh, okay. Um, so what I do at each time step is uh, set the boundary conditions. So I set these ones to zero because right now these guard cells are just there for the boundaries. Um, and then for the interior, I will apply the stencil and compute a new 
new T, and then to make sure that that all works, I copy the new T in the in the next T. So you can also see that this is a uh, uh, yeah. So that's the serial version, right? Um, now imagine that we split this up in in different segments in MPI. It suddenly becomes a much larger code. Okay, this is this is true. Some of it is just MPI uh, standard stuff, MPI init, MPI finalize, ask for rank, ask for size. Because remember that in, in MPI, every process is running the same code and has to just has to itself figure out what to do based on its rank and how many of their of the workers are there. Right. So in this case, we're going to we're going to do that too. Rank and size. We're going to figure out who is my left neighbor, rank minus one. Who is my right neighbor, rank plus one. Except if I'm on the very left, and then I'm using this MPI proc null as a special process number. That's not really a number that says the left doesn't exist. Um, I I then have to cut up the domain. So the, so again, the domain decomposition isn't automatic in any sort of way. And all uh, processes will have to do it by themselves. So imagine for now that the true size is n, and that n is is exactly divisible by size, so by the number of processes I have. So imagine that in the in the previous case uh, example, we had two processes that n is even. So that local n, which is the number of points I need in each process, is just n divided by size. Okay. Uh, a doesn't change the prefactor. Um, the guards change in the sense that um, I have a guard left at zero and a guard right at local n plus one. So there should only be an array T that is as big as local n. I, I did not put the allocation here uh, of the arrays, but the arrays only have to be local n big. The whole point was that this, this is supposedly not fitting in memory. So if I try to, to allocate an array of size n, um, that it wouldn't fit. So I only need an array of local n of really local n plus one, right? And then the zero one in that array is card left and local n plus one is card right. Um, then we have time stepping. Uh, let's skip this for a second and look at the last part. The last part is exactly the same. So the algorithm is not changed because I'm going to take care of the guard cells. So um, the first thing I'll, I'll, so I'll work from the bottom uh, up and so the the for the uh, algorithm to not be different, um, I would have to make sure that at least the boundary conditions are done the same. Um, now, if I'm ranked zero, then my left part is is truly the left part. So uh, uh, so that has to be set as the boundary condition, which was zero. So that's what remains of this equals zero. Uh, if I'm the very last. Um, process, so my rank is then size minus one, then I have to set my guard cell to zero. So those are the boundary conditions, they're still there. And then the other ones are, are to set the guard cells according to what's in the other processes. So I have send receives here, I'm going to send TI1 to my left. So imagine that I'm, I'm rank one, say, I have, to, I have to send my T1 to the left, but then it has to be received into the guard right cell of the process receiving it. And this is always a little bit tricky to get because I, I am a, I, I'm a sender and a receiver at the same end, same time. So uh, imagine that I'm, I'm process zero. I am sending my one, which is six to the left, but I'm receiving something in my guard left at the same time. I don't care where that came from. It's just, I'm just gonna receive something. From my left neighbor, so that's what this does, right? In in my uh, guard left, I'm going to receive something. I'm also going to receive something in my guard right, um, and and this is this is how it works. So that was the interchange, um, which is which is very. I mean, this requires you to have to to do some drawing. I mean, without without some pencil and paper and thinking where things go, this is really hard to just guess and get right. It's very easy to 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 make mistakes. Uh, you kind of have to draw it out and see what goes where and what is what is sending where and how do I uh, how do I send receives? Now I'm doing send receives. I could do separate sends and receives, but then as you can see, it, it might be possible to have all of the processes sent and nobody receiving, and I could have deadlock. So that's kind of why I use send receives. Okay. So 
it seems like this idea of having uh, guard cells, uh, sure, I'll go over one more thing, uh, doesn't really make the code almost the same. I said it's the same algorithm, so you don't have to change that much. It's just the boundary conditions. But the boundary conditions need a lot of uh, a, a lot of thought. So, so forget about the init and the, the rank and size. We need that. We have figured out what is left and what is right um, uh, in terms of processes and how much we have. Okay. Um, we also have figured out the uh, uh, the boundary conditions, but they only have to be applied if you're actually at the boundaries. So that's that. That's that. The send receive. Let's look at it very carefully one more time. So we are sending from we're sending our leftmost point to the left. It's going to become a guard cell there. Okay. And I'm going to receive at the same time something in my right guard cell from the right. So I'm sending to the left my first element and receiving from the right something um, that comes from the right. And that something that comes from the right is going to be the T1 that I, that I, that I have. So, it, so I'm doing, I should have drawn one more process, but um, so this process, if there was another one, would also be receiving something up. So, so I'm only doing up arrows in this, in this process, uh, in the send receive. I'm, I'm sending my one, my, my first one away, and I'm receiving something in my rightmost uh, card cells. So this is one receiving into 11. Oh, sorry, one receiving into what is it? It's six. It's, it's guard cell right. And then that's, that's all of the communication that goes to the left. And then I'm going to do all the communication that goes to the right. For the right, I have to send my n local. So that's my last real point, not a go cell, my last real point to the right. And I have to receive on the left side something in my guard cell, which will be the thing that was sent by my left neighbor from its uh, rightmost point. Everything going to the left here, everything going to the right here. Um, another thing that you might notice is that uh, this is a matrix multiplying in essence. So we could have tried a DGEM for the submatrix. Uh, D, D, uh, sorry, DGEM P. Um, we didn't because it, it, it's harder to do with uh, to enforce with sparsity. But um, another thing you might notice is that the way it's set up, I could also have open MP the inner loop. Um, it's a it's a nice loop. Or uh, even here, it's still a nice loop. There could be. Uh, open MP parallelized with no issues because I'm storing the new result in another array, so there's no race conditions, and that's true. And we'll see how how you might do that uh, in a, a few slides uh, later. But this idea of combining MPI and Open MP is, is totally possible, and I'll, I'll have some hints on how to do that. Okay, so the question: What one and eleven that are given to send and receive? Oh, so the 11 is the tag. So remember, all messages get a tag so that you can be sure that you get the right tag. So here I chose the tag to just be 11. I just chose a random number, um, not, not random. I chose a, a, a number for all of them. Um, I could have chosen different tags for the send right to make sure that what is sent to the right is received by something that's expected from the left. Um, but I could not have chosen different numbers here because then... Uh, the tags won't match, so the tags have to match. It's a, it's a safety measure. Uh, the one here is uh, how many how many uh, elements I'm sending. So I could send more than one element. So so it's a C it's a C call, right? So I'm giving a pointer here, but it's also I could send more than one thing. I can send a whole array. In this case, I only need one point because I only need this one guard cell. If I had two guard cells, I I don't have to do two sends. I could send them all at once by saying that I want two, two MPI doubles. So I'm sending one MPI double, one MPI double, one MPI double, one MPI double with a tag of 11. That's what those mean. Now, uh, that's in 1D and it's, it's relatively doable in 1D. Um, in 2D, there's different ways you can, you can divide the domain, right? 
you could imagine doing it sort of in, in this way where you have um, um, two by three blocks in a, if the original domain was six by six uh, and I wanted to divide it over six processes, then I could do blocks of two by three and like here, or I could just make slabs uh, of one by six. This is easier to code in, in the sense that um, it, I'm really just say parallelizing in one direction. So whatever happens in the other direction, I don't have to worry about. And so it's easier, but there are some advantages if you, if you decompose in this way, because you will have less communication. The communication has to happen. Remember, these are just boundaries, right? The communication happens across the domains. And if we imagine communication to be the, the, the slowest part here, uh, we can count how many uh, edges we have here. And it's uh, six here, six here, six here, 18. Whereas here I have one, two, three, four, five, 30 uh, uh, edges. And so there'll be more communication uh, when your uh, domains are not, are not sort of compact. Um, but it is harder to program. Um, it, it could be, could be tricky because on the other end, if you're sending some non-contiguous data, you have to create an MPI data type and, and we won't go into that. So it is, it is, but it is a bit trickier, but it is worthwhile to do if you have um, a lot of processors, uh, because the more processes you have, um, the more you're going to split up your domain, the more communication versus computation you have. So you want to minimize the computation uh, uh, in the long run anyway. It's a little bit like, uh, like we talked about the serial part of, a, of an application. And it, it's not the same. This is a communication part. And a lot of the communication can be done in parallel, but, uh, but it is something that can slow down your, your code. So um, yeah, so even in this simple example, you can already see that the communication is, uh, is more in, in, in this case. All right, so let me count the edges. So, so it's the edges between differently colored regions, but the boundaries do not count. They're just set to zero by their local, uh, their, their local processes, right? There, there's no communication. This isn't another process. So one, two, three, four, five, six across uh, this. So all, all of them across here are edges. And one, two, three, four, five, six across these guys. And one, two, three, four, five, six again. So that's six. And then here, six, 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 six. So that's 30. Oh, the corners here? No, I just drew them. That's true. In this case, you do not, uh, you do not need them because the stencil doesn't cover them. Uh, it'll be tricky to create an array that is, because um, you'll have to have an, is like eight by eight, but excludes those corners. So in most cases, you will have those corners. Uh, they don't matter, that's true, but you, you keep them anyway. Uh, it's just easier than, than trying to come up with a data type that, that is almost rectangular, but has no corners. Um, so you wouldn't do that. Yeah, exactly, it's just convenient to have it there. Hexagonal, uh, so like a hexagonal grid, yes, you can definitely do that, but now you're, you're, you're it's, it's uh, trickier to figure out because now you don't have uh, up, down, left, and right, but you have six directions in which you can go. It can be useful uh, indeed, and, and sometimes and that's exactly what you do uh, to, uh, to, to make the communication as least as possible. But then at that point, you might even want some sort of unstructured grid like this one, where um, there can be all kinds of shapes, just whatever is, is necessary. Um, and if you are in that situation, there are um, tools that can help you uh, decompose your domain before you start running, it, et cetera. But that's, uh, um, yeah, it, it gets very domain specific, but not intended. So, um, so let's look at, uh, at the easiest case for 2D for a second. Um, so what happens if we split this up, say, um, but let's split it up in three processes only, just to see how it goes and why it's a little bit trickier, um, because we now get guard cells all over the place, right? So the number of cells is kind of growing uh, quite a bit. And the communication now has to be a whole strip that has to be sent down or up, right? Uh, so this is where you'll have multiple MPI doubles at one point. So you won't have one comma MPI double, you'd have 
uh, I guess six in this case, right? Um, and so you, you can do that um, for these ones. But here, just uh, if we if we uh, if we did it, up, right, right? No. if we if we needed to sell uh, needed to send um, things in this sort of arrangement, I now have to send these two cells over, but they're not contiguous in memory. So now there's 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 uh, you need to uh, uh, you need to do something else. Um, there are ways to create a data type that is not contiguous in MPI and send that, and that's probably what you would do in this case. Um, others might choose to just create a new array that is contiguous, just copy over the data values into that array and send that. And there's there's uh, pros and cons to both, but it is definitely um, um, a different thing. Uh, Beran uh, suggests Scotch for decomposition, and yes, that's one of those tools that I was talking about. Um, when it's not a simple rectangular grid or there is um, uh, uneven um, unevenness in the in the load, the computational load per grid point, uh, you want to you want to fine tune your decomposition um, to, because that again can can lead otherwise to inefficient parallelization. In that case, you could have uh, uh, nodes that aren't doing anything, whereas one node is still doing all of the work, um, and and so you lose effectively some of the parallelism in that. Okay, so so that's domain decomposition, and and uh, you wouldn't be surprised to see that the uh, assignment will will be using that. Um, but there's a few other things that are really nice to know are possible with MPI that I I uh, would like to share with you. So one thing that I already mentioned is that you can you don't have to do or either OpenMP or MPI. You can do both. OpenMP is it's a little bit easier. There's less code to be changed. Uh, you have to think less about what gets sent where, uh, but it only works up to a whole node because it only works in shared memory machines. And so the nodes do not share memory. Uh, but you can do a hybrid approach where you use MPI and OpenMP. And as far as coding is involved, it's not that difficult. Um, you just use MPI calls when you have to do MPI and you use OpenMP directives where there's like a for loop that can be parallelized. You usually, if you do this, uh, do the MPI part first. It's the trickiest part. Um, and, uh, and so you want to get that out of the way. Uh, it, it needs more change in your code than OpenMP. But also, if you do OpenMP, you might be assuming a, a shared memory model uh, and then you have to break that somewhere in the middle. So it's, it's trickier. Usually you do MPI first, and then you see in each MPI process, are there any like for loops or some other things that they can do in parallel? Um, there's one more thing that you have to keep in mind. Um, if you're doing MPI calls and OpenMP threads, um, you might have a case where different threads are using MPI calls at the same time. And so you want to ask your library if that is possible. So the MPI library that you have may or may not support this. Uh, so you, you can ask. And the way you ask that is if you're going to do hybrid uh, MPI OpenMP, instead of initializing with MPI init, you initialize with MPI init thread. And so um, the first two arguments are the same as in init. So you just pass the, uh, the in main arguments with an ampersand. Um, and then you, uh, you can ask what you want in terms of the, the, the level of support for hybrids. And, uh, and it will give you back into this other variable what it actually supports. So you can ask something and it says, well, this is what you're actually getting. Um, the values of acquired and provided uh, that you can get are one of these four. Um, so you can have MPI thread single as a requirement. And what that means is that you promise that the code will actually only have one thread. So that's that's like doing doing nothing, but it, it at least tells MPI, don't worry about anything. Uh, there'll be only one thread. Um, so that's not what we want here. Um, there's MPI funneled, uh, which is uh, so now you are going to use threads, but um, but there's only going to but the only the only MPI calls you're going to make are from the uh, the thread that called MPI init thread. So this is this is usually the the main thread, right? The one that you started with, and so only thread. It's not even thread zero per se. Only the threads uh, um, uh, that started this, which means 
you're really only making MPI calls from what you would call the MPM open MP serial regions, so non parallel regions outside of uh, Pragma OMP blocks. That is funneled. So all of the MPI is funneled through the, the master strategy one, through the non open MP regions, through the serial regions. Um, you can imagine that that is almost always supported because what could go wrong? It's, 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 there's, there's no race conditions possible. Um, it, it's hard to imagine that that, that is a, an issue uh, for an MPI library. Uh, the next level you could have is where uh, the threads are what's called serialized. So you now promise that although different threads might be calling MPI, um, they're only calling MPI one at a time. And your code will take care of, of, of that. That is indeed the case, however it does that. Um, so that, again, really says to the library, well, it's kind of safe, whatever, uh, whatever you're using in your functions, the functions are never called at the same time by different threads. So, so again, what could go wrong? These are almost, uh, almost trivially supportable. But then the next and final level that you can require is to say, no, no, all my threads might be calling MPI uh, uh, from, from any of the threads, and, and so deal with it. So that one isn't always supported. Okay, so when you get an MPI library and you want to uh, do MPI calls from within an OMP parallel region uh, from all of the threads, that could be an issue. So you would you, you try to stay away from this. It also makes your, com your code way more complex. Uh, you don't know which thread is going to receive the sends that you send from one thread because when you send, you still can't specify that you want to send to a specific thread. You send to a specific process. So now, it, it kind of it, it's really hard to keep track of things. You'd have to use tags uh, in in ways that they weren't designed for. So um, if you can stay away from this model, but you know if you have to, you have, it's there. So so you always call within the init thread. You check whether you're provided the support that you want, and if it's really essential that the support is there, you probably will exit. Uh, this. So we have found, for instance, a lot of the open MPI. Uh, libraries that we have on Niagara do not support MPI thread multiple, uh, whereas the Intel MPI do. Um, it, there's technicalities for why this is so, uh, but this might this might be one of those cases where uh, you want to use one or the other. So that, so other than that, you just you just call MPI probably from the master thread or from a single thread, and uh, use OpenMP wherever you can, and it and it's done in terms of the code, right? But now you still have to think about how you're gonna run. See, usually when you're using pure MPI, you have a number of cores available and you run on all of them. If you have an open MPI uh, code, you use all the cores of your machine, just one node, that's fine. But now you have to choose how many, how, you, how you're gonna divide up the work because you don't have to do it such that uh, there's one MPI process per node and then threads within that node. It doesn't have to be that way. So for instance, if you wanted to run, say, on three nodes uh, on the teach cluster, right, which gives you three times 16 is 48 workers all in all, uh, you could want, you might want to divide that such that there are, there are two MPI processes per node, so, so six MPI processes in total, but two per node, three nodes, and each of these processes can use eight threads, and you have to be very specific about these things. If you're using Slurm, um, so you, so uh, then then you can ask the uh, the scheduler the Slurm scheduler and uh, that that you want three nodes that you want two tasks per node so tasks here stands for really stands for MPI processes uh, and then eight CPUs per task so eight and so Slurm calls them CPUs we would call them FEDs but that's that's how it counts okay, so lay down the hierarchy so to speak of things uh, below the modules we set the OMP num threads and so you can use the fact that Slurm puts uh, its value of CPUs per task in dollar slurp CPUs per task. Uh, so it doesn't know, I don't have to hard code that or make mistakes. Um, and then I can just MPI run it. So at this stage, MPI run has, has received from the scheduler that there are two tasks per node and three nodes. So it will run six tasks, two per node distributed. And it will receive, because we've set the OMP num thread, that there are to be eight threads within of those. So that is going to be the sort of six processes with the eight threads separately. Uh, but you have to be specific. If you don't say these things, uh, OMP num threads 
is going to be assumed to be the total number of threads on the, the total number of cores on the machine, which is going to be uh, 16. So now you overload your, your cores by a factor of two. You do not want that. Um, if you don't say how many tasks per node you want, uh, all six are going to be run on, on the first node because there's enough cores. So if you don't say that, you'd have six processes running on node one, each of them taking 16 tasks. You have six times 16 tasks on that poor node that only has 16 cores. So six times overloaded and the others are not, not there. You have to specify this very specific. Okay. It's not very difficult, but it, you know, it's good to know the tasks that you have to do. And even if you're running on your own machine or on a logger node for short tests, for instance, um, you have to specify how you want to divide the workers that you're going to be using over MPI processes and threads. So uh, say you wanted uh, four MPI processes, um, you have to do MPI run dash N4, and you want each of them to use three threads, you have to export OMP number test to three. So that's where you set your, your variables there. Um, it usually takes some tuning. It depends on the machine. What is a good division between threads and API processes? Sometimes it turns out that the, the best uh, performance is pure MPI. Sometimes the best performance is one MPI per node and, and the rest threads. Sometimes two. Um, a lot of machines actually use two sockets with different CPUs in one node. So then the factor of two kind of makes sense. Sometimes it's a, a matter of memory. Uh, how the memory is, is, is connected to the CPUs as to what works best. So you really can't know it until you sort of test it. Um, any questions about running hybrid? If you specify two MPI tasks per node, do they each get half the memory? Uh, no. It, it, well, it depends a little bit on your setup, but no. Um, they tend to share the memory that they can get. So uh, on the Teach cluster, as well as on, on Niagara, uh, we're not so picky with, with memory. Um, most of the time, you run on a full node anyway. So if you have two MPI tasks per node, uh, if they run a similar thing, then obviously they're going to only be able to use half the memory just because both of them use half the memory. But you could have one process use 80% of the memory and the other task 20%, and that would run just fine. These aren't, uh, these aren't uh, limited uh, in, in this way. On other clusters, you might have to say how much memory you want per, uh, per task, and then that could be limits. But that depends on the scheduler. In our case, no. Uh, the memory that you get um, is uh, might be restricted because you don't ask for a full node, um, but um, this isn't the case on either the Teach or the Niagara cluster. Um, so the, the memory limit is not supposed to be per per process, but per, per but for the overall of the, the per node, if you want. Okay, so I wanted to end with one more thing that is that is always more important than you think, then that's IO. Um, because I always often the slowest part of a computing system. Right? The disks are not that fast. Um, if you don't write out IO too often or you don't read too much, obviously it doesn't matter, it's a small fraction. But um, if you're running large systems that don't fit within a, a node's memory, you're gonna have large data to write out. But that's, so there's gonna be IO and it's gonna be slow. Um, so to help with this slowness, uh, what supercomputers have are parallel file systems. Uh, we have one um, and they all take, there's different types. We have one that, that used to be called GPFS. Uh, on the Teach cluster, we do not have a parallel file system. We just, we just piggyback over NFS. Um, on, on the other systems in Compute Canada, they have Luster, but they're all parallel file systems that on the back end have lots of disks. So if the disks are slow, but you have a thousand of them, it shouldn't be so bad, right? But it does, that only works if you can write to the, the, these disks in parallel, right? Read and write parallel. Um, if you ran, if you, if you wanted to write a file, say, and you had your six uh, process MPI uh, run going, and the only way to write to it would be to collect all of the data back to process zero and have it write, then while that would work, that would not be parallel because it would all go through the same file and so therefore through the same back uh, single disk if you want. 
Now, um, just as we can't just use more cores or use more nodes and just say say that to the to the computer and it will do it, we have to we have, parallelization is not automatic, not also not for I/O, and so um, we have to do this ourselves. We have to program in the parallel I/O. Um, how do we do that? There's a few ways we can do that. Uh, one way, which is kind of similar and works up to a point, is to just have each process write out its portion into a separate file. So suppose I want to write out this, this, this uh, temperature field. Each of the processes has a sub part of it, and each of them creates a new file and writes its part and done. Right? Now, you get a lot of files. right? That's, that tends to be not that good. Um, but also, the number of files you get depends on how many processes you are using in, uh, in your run. So if in the next run you want to use more processes, uh, you have an issue because right? you can't read it in. It depends on the number of processes. Um, and what is maybe more important is that um, if you're writing many files to the same directory, because it's a shared file system, uh, you can get what's called directory locking. So this means that effectively only one process can read, a, read or write at the same time. And, and so your parallelism is gone. Uh, there's ways around it by creating different directories for each file in a process, which works OK for our file system. It doesn't work for some file systems. Um, in any case, while this works up to a point, when you have many, many processes, it'll, it's going to break. Um, so if it's going to break, what, you, what, what would you do instead? So there's a few possibilities. Um, and you can use them in in combination or or in in, in parts, right? You could you could do everything yourself and say, okay, I don't want many files, but what if I have one in every ten process collect the data of ten processes and write that out? That's ten times as many as as, as fewer files. That should help, and it would. So you can do that. You could do it hierarchically. You can, you can come up with that, um, but you'd still be doing a, a lot a bunch of sendings and receivings. Uh, through MPI from one process to the other. Um, another way that is baked into the MPI standard is to use what's called MPI IO. It's a sub library and enables binary parallel file IO to single files from all processes. So you can have one file that's open that is shared among all processes, but because MPI knows about it, rather than getting uh, directory locking or, 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 uh, or other bottlenecks, the, the, the library deals with, uh, with your requests smoothly. And then on top of that are also uh, as, uh, it's also possible for NetCDF and HEF5 to allow parallel IO. There's others. Uh, the, the caveat there is that these libraries have to be uh, uh, compiled with parallel IO support. And they might not always uh, be. If you just get them from a package manager, they probably aren't. Um, so that's, that's uh, but it does, it is possible and won't go into it because there's not that much time. Um, but um, it is possible to, to basically have your output into a NetCDF file, which was created in parallel so that each process just wrote its part of the, of the domain. And the NetCDF file is, is now agnostic to the number of processes that you wrote from. So you could, you could read that in with more or less processes if you need, and that's nice. The same is true for MPIO, but MPIO is part of MPI. So we're going to go quickly over how that, how that works or what it, what it is. Um, so it's not that different from any other IO library. It's similar to normal files. Um, so there's a thing that is a file in, and it's called MPI underscore file, uh, which you can open, but you open it from all processes at the same time. So you'll have to uh, uh, use a communicator, say which processes are, are opening this file at the same time. Um, and then much as in the, the NetCDF examples, you have to say how you want to open it. So I want to open it for writing only, and I want to create it if it doesn't exist yet. Um, and those kind of mode flags. Um, info, you can give it some extra info that helps it, but typically you don't. Uh, so okay, info null. And then you fill the file handle. So much, much as other C libraries, it now changes this file, and this file is now open, and it's the handle to the file. And then I can seek in the file, which means I can go to a different position. I can write to the file. I can close the file. This is all possible. Okay. Now, you notice that I created an offset here. So um, I imagine that there are 
a bunch of messages being sent, uh, be, being written to this file. Okay, they all have a certain size, and they have to they have to be written in different parts of the file. Where would they have to be written? Well, uh, if I can use a rank for that and say, well, they're going to be written at message size times rank. Um, and then when I'm writing, I'm only writing message size. And so what's happening here is that the file is opened by all of the processes. They all write to different parts of the file, and that will enable MPIO to say, okay, I can write these in parallel, um, and then close the file. So this is a very um, low level way of doing it. And every time you, you wanna write something, you have to determine where to write it. There's better ways uh, in which you can set up your file and you can set up your data layout. And uh, maybe you, you lay it out in this sort of a fashion where you have big blocks that are uh, sort of propriety to each process, but you can also have it in a way where uh, every other uh, number is is or is is owned by uh, by another process. So uh, all of the say if you had two processes, all of the even uh, doubles would be uh, owned by by rank zero, and all of the odd ones by by rank one. And you can do it such that once you actually start writing, you do not have to uh, compute exactly where in a file you want to write. Rather, you just write as if it's a normal file, but you've been uh, you've laid out how uh, how the different parts of the file should be distributed over the processes. That's a little bit tricky uh, for sure, which is why I'm not actually going to show you how to do it. Um, but it but it is how you would do it if you want to build more code that looks more like uh, writing to a regular file rather than really specifying where to run. Um, you in the in the previous example, this is a new example. In the previous example, I wrote uh, to the file uh, with this MPI file, right? That can be done by different processes at different times, um, and so they don't have to do it all at the same time. It doesn't don't have to be in lockstep. But when it is in lockstep, you can do a write at all. So the write at all writes from all of the processes at the same time. So it's a collective call at a specific point, uh, here's the offset. Um, and that's and, and so when it's collective, you get the, the library even more chance to sort of optimize the uh, the IO patterns um, to, to your advantage. Whereas here, there could be collisions. Um, MPI should check for those, right? So, so that means that the very fact that it has to check for them means that it can be a little slower. Um, what if I, I got my message site wrong, message size wrong in one of the processes, and the messages overlap. Um, the M MPI has to promise that it makes some sort of sense, right? But in, in essence, we now have a race condition, um, and and uh, and that either gets resolved, but still has to be uh, communicated among the different processes. Where here, um, even if there is a uh, here, basically at this point. The API library can detect that there is some sort of race condition and, 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 and you know, resolve it once, and then the, the writing itself is as fast as it can be. Now, there's many, many functions in this sublibrary. Uh, opening files, uh, the set view is, is where you specify the layout. Uh, you can write from one process, you can write at a specific point in a process, in a, in a file. You can write from all processes. You can write from all processes at a specific spot. Same for reading and closing, but there's way more uh, uh, file IO um, functions. We won't go into them. Um, what we've shown is, is, is fairly basic and, and functional. And note also that there's, like with all MPI calls, lots of arguments to these functions. Uh, the man pages are, in a, are, are available in the teach cluster. So once you have OpenMPI loaded, um, you can do this man, man and then one of the, uh, the function names and it'll give you uh, the explanation of, of, of uh, what goes where. So don't forget that. So this allows you to have a single file, right? From the whole process. So it doesn't matter if it was across nodes or not across nodes um, and, and, um, and, and allows, uh, uh, these processes to coordinate their, their IO and, and not get into sort of deadlocks and, and, and race conditions. Questions?
If not, then uh, as I said, we will post the last assignment um, today. Um, if you have missed an assignment in the past, uh, we will give you a chance to do a makeup assignment, but that will be posted even later. Um, and for that assignment, you will get a week like normal, but there won't be any extension. You just have to do it within that week. Um, but we'll, we'll send around an email with the specifications once the once the time comes for for that, and once you you uh, once we've done the other ones, okay. Well then, um, see you all either at the office hours or or the last lecture on on Thursday. <laughs>